Good morning, everybody, and thank you for watching and participating. We had a slight delay, but now we are ready for business. This has been an eventful week in the North Dakota side, in which we're reopening our businesses, uh, go and restart is what we're trying to do. And we have found when the increased capacity and increased opening up business, it's also hard to be COVID uh, protective, and that has been quite of the challenge that we have. We'd like to introduce Director of Fargo Class Public Health, Desi Fleming. She is also the co-chair of the Red River Valley COVID-19 Task Force. She's gonna update us on what's going on. Most of today's session is more focused on business and smart restart so that people can understand what the expectations in our business community are. Desi? Thank you, Mary. Good morning, sorry for the technical difficulties this morning. Uh, Mayor Mahoney asked me to provide a snapshot of a few of the operations Fargo Cast Public Health is performing during this ongoing pandemic. Although he, we have been in a supportive role to the North Dakota Department of Health, Fargo Cast Public Health has led local coordination and response efforts for COVID activities on the North Dakota side. Our Health Department Operations the Department Operations Center, or, or the DOC, was stood up on March 17th. At that time, there was only seven of us. As the needs have grown, 75% of our 152 team members have recorded time for COVID efforts, with many of the hours well above their normal schedule and routine hours. I would like to take a moment to highlight just two of those activities. Our harm reduction staff are currently supporting the homeless housing project in our community. That group was chosen due to their ability to work effectively with at-risk populations, as well as the established relationships they have with many in the community. They are a very special group of people full of passion and empathy and dedicated to making life brighter for the guests they serve. They do a tremendous job and have always gone above and beyond during this pandemic. Contact tracing is our largest operation, which I've mentioned before, and has gained recognition nationally for our state as North Dakota has one of the best contact tracing per capita ratios. We know effective contact tracing is a critical step to help slow the spread of COVID in our community. This work requires a lot of patience and perseverance, sacrificing regular work schedules and taking them away from time with their families. I may be biased, but I truly believe our group is the best in the state. Having staff on site, six feet apart, of course, working collectively to address issues, making connections of contacts, learning from each other, and working directly with disease control has made our group very successful and efficient in their work. Switching gears, our Red River Valley Task Force activities are ongoing. We continue to receive comments and questions on our website. There's been a few questions on the process of how the task force was chosen and if we are taking any new members. The process really involved collaboration between state and local partners, including Clay County and Minnesota, that had already been involved in COVID activities. By forming the task force, we were able to come together to focus on a common goal. We were also able to bring in subject matter experts to address specific areas. Task force activities were developed to support targeted testing, contact tracing, and quarantine and isolation. At this time, the task force is still in the early stages as we work through our various strategies and are presently not adding any new members. If you'd like more information on the task force, please visit our webpage at fargocastpublichealth.com slash task force. There's been a lot of discussion in the news lately on where we're at in this pandemic as a nation, specifically around herd immunity. Experts estimate that there will need to be greater than 60 to 70 percent of individuals infected by COVID to reach some level of herd immunity. Uh, for example, Sweden experimented with a limited lockdown in an effort to build up immunity in their population, and recent studies indicate that no more than 17 percent of the people there have been infected so far. In the U.S., it's estimated on average around 5% of the population has been infected. So what that means is there's a significant amount of our population that is not immune and susceptible to COVID disease. Let's not lose sight that COVID-19 is the leading cause of death in America right now, taking 2,000 lives daily. The reality is it's here. We aren't going to have a vaccine anytime soon. And all we have right now are preventative measures, testing, contact tracing, and social distancing. So a few thoughts to close. There's a lot of stress, frustration, and fear in our current climate. Everyone's tired. When we get tired, people tend to have heightened responses or lack responses to issues. It feels like everyone is struggling to maintain balance and perspective, and it's difficult to find that middle ground. There's a feeling of division across the nation, and public health issues have become political, which is an arena that health cannot be in if we're going to be successful in this pandemic. 
We need to have a collective effort from everyone to protect their health as well as those around them. With restrictions loosening, it becomes much more important to work together as a community to slowly expand the North Dakota restart, Smart Restarts efforts while adhering to all the prevention measures we have learned. There are no days off in a pandemic. I know that's what we all don't want to hear, but that's the reality right now. So we need to search for the positives. There's a quote from Mr. Rogers that always brings in a little cheer. He says, when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. We have a community full of helpers ready to support each other, and for that, we are very fortunate. So as always, be smart, be kind, be safe, indoors and out. Thank you. Thank you, Desi. Good reminders, good health. Our next speaker is uh, Clay County Public Health, Kathy McKay. Kathy? Thank you, Mayor Mahoney, um, and good morning, everyone. Our, our Clay County Public Health staff, um, we have about a quarter of our staff working um, in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Health on our COVID response. We were working with local organizations to uh, share COVID information. We've been providing information and guidance to local businesses, as well as the Fargo Moorhead and West Fargo Chamber. Uh, we have a number of staff that are increasing um, to provide case investigation and contact tracing uh, to assist the Minnesota Department of Health in those efforts. Minnesota Department of Health just released a health advisory on mass gatherings. They're recommending expanded COVID-19 testing due to our recent mass events, the civil unrest and the response to the civil unrest that occurred across the state. The fact that there were people participating in the events from outside our communities, we may see an increase in the number of our COVID-19 cases. Many people have been exposed due to the large concentration of people in one area for an extended period of time, the lack of social distancing, and many not wearing masks. So identifying and testing individuals who may have participated in large public events will improve the ability to identify the cases and then institute uh, appropriate isolation and quarantine measures. So anyone that has participated in some of the large gatherings with the cleanup and recovery efforts, um, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, um, should consider testing. This would also include those uh, that are responding to the events as well. We also continue to do our targeted testing, um, and that is ongoing with our congregate care settings, both staff and residents, and we avail ourselves to the the static sites that Fargo has provided. Minnesota has moved into phase two of the safe, stay safe plan. Uh, that started June 1st. It marks some changes with restaurants, personal services, um, youth sports, school buildings, et cetera. And Mayor Judd will talk more about that. Pools remain closed in Minnesota to the general public. However, they can be open to those in organized youth sports and programs, as well as some therapy pools. They also need to have a preparedness plan, which should include things like the reduced capacity, staggering swim schedules, and social distancing capabilities. The city of Moorhead will have pools that will be closed most of the summer, if not all summer. For details on these changes, please visit the Minnesota State website. The County Public Health also has links to the website um, on our Facebook page. We also want to remind people that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention released a toolkit for businesses. Resuming business toolkit is designed to assist employers in slowing the spread of COVID-19 and lowering the impact in their workplace um, when they're reintegrating employees into the business settings. It's available online on the CDC website. It includes information on restart readiness checklists to uh, help with making return and resume, resuming business operations in a safe and healthy way as possible, a worker protection tool for employees. And the toolkit also highlights how employees can protect themselves and others from COVID-19. As Minnesota moves into this space, we appreciate everyone's efforts as they follow the public health guidelines. We all have the ability to protect our community. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Paul Car Carls Carson from uh, NDSU, and he's going to go over some new interesting things that we've discovered over the last several weeks. Good morning, Mayor Mahone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you could pull up our slides, please. Uh, and while those are being pulled up, I'll be going over just a little bit of uh, where we're currently at with the epidemiology in uh, the state. And so uh, the first slide here uh, shows that uh, when we look at active cases in North Dakota, we're sitting at about 454 active cases. About 75% of those are in Cass County. Uh, we have 332 active cases as of yesterday. Um, when we look at uh, the rates of test positivity, we see that uh, over twice the number in Cass County as the rest of the state with 5.6% of our cases tested positive with a 14-day rolling average compared to 2.3% in the rest of the state. Um, in the When we look at deaths in the state, uh, there have been 65 as of yesterday. Uh, um, 54 of those have been here in Cass County. When we look a little more deeply at this, um, we see that in Cass County, we have about 20% of our cases and 85% of our deaths have been associated with uh, long-term care facilities, both um, as far as the cases, both residents and staff, and uh, um, and the deaths have been uh, obviously uh, residents. This has been an intense area of focus for us with a number of efforts uh, um, of increased testing and uh, to help mitigate uh, the spread of uh, COVID in these long-term care facilities, which have been very, very challenging to try and keep that under control. Uh, the good news there is that the number of active cases is uh, steadily going down and there are increasing numbers of recovered residents and staff. And now even at the start of some conversations about whether, uh, how and when and, uh, and in what way we may be able to start lifting some restrictions for those residents that have uh, recovered and that's being explored. So next slide, please. Um, well, look at actually new cases in North Dakota. Um, this is a seven day rolling average. Um, you can see that uh, a little over a week ago, you know, numbers had gone up uh, somewhat and that was uh, in conjunction with increased testing efforts and shift in the number of tests being done in Cass County, particularly with targeted uh, places and situations where we thought there was higher risk. And we, we did find more cases with that, but we think that some of those efforts are starting to bear fruit because you can see now in the last week, the, the average number of cases is starting to fall. And if I could have the next slide, please. Um, and one of the things that I've encouraged uh, people to do when looking at where we're at with epidemiology, uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Ty. Um, when looking at the epidemiology on this is to look at um, the most objective measures. So uh, the number of cases and tests um, will sort of rise and fall with where you happen to be targeting efforts that day. It's, it's not a steady process and sometimes it's focused on a business or a particular facility uh, or a particular situation with an outbreak. And so uh, things may spike one day and come down the next. Uh, a more objective measure that is not subject to the vagaries of uh, testing is uh, hospitalizations and deaths. And you can see that um, uh, both of those have been actually quite flat and maybe even starting to see a little uh, fall in our uh, number of hospitalizations. So those, those average somewhere between one to three hospitalizations a day, uh, deaths between zero to a little over one, um, and those have remained flat. So we've really achieved that first and highest priority goal, which was to uh, um, be able to take care of and patients with this in our healthcare systems and not overburden or overtax our healthcare systems. And those curves have remained uh, flat and maybe improving. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, if we go across uh, the river to our sister community in Moorhead and in Clay County, um, uh, testing has been steadily increasing in Minnesota and uh, Clay County now uh, has had 433 cases. Uh, only 29 of which are currently active, and um, they've had 29 deaths. And if I could have the next slide, please. Similar in um, Clay County to what we've experienced here in Cass County, as you can see by um, source of exposure, there's a, a really a substantial portion of those that are associated with congregate living settings, particularly long-term uh, care facilities. And next slide, please. Um, getting back to that uh, rate of positivity, this is a trend line of a rolling average over 14 days. 
um, in Cass County in the state, and this is the percent of tests that are positive. Um, and this sort of rises and falls with different events. Uh, although the bulk of these tests are still made up by um, persons going to our various healthcare systems to be tested, presumably due to symptoms uh, or signs of having infection. And uh, although we're still uh, certainly higher in Cass County than the rest of the state, that trend is going down and getting uh, slowly closer to the uh, state average. And we hope to see that continue as we continue our focused efforts in Cass County. Uh, next slide, please. And I uh, just repeat the kind of message that we want to be prepared, not panicked, and we are uh, really continuing to focus our efforts here in Cass County. We're working with the state to get even more granular data that gives us a, a deeper look at uh, what's happening in Cass County to help us figure our work even uh, uh, better and more effectively. Um, I'll turn back to you and thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Great data. Good, good to do, Dr. Paul. Our next speaker is Fargo Cass Public uh, Environmental Health Practitioner, Chris Ullman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one of our primary roles here in environmental health is to uh, provide education to our businesses and the partnerships we have, um, whether we regulate them or not. Um, one of the major changes that we, we've observed um, on Friday was when the governor's office decided to decrease our risk level from yellow to green. Um, under yellow, uh, businesses were allowed to have 50% capacity with no more than 250 people maximum in the facility. Now they're allowed to go to 75% capacity and no more than 500 people. Um, so this changes mass gatherings quite significantly. Under the new risk levels, we're continuing to uh, promote the practice of social distance, uh, both indoor and outdoor venues, uh, where social distancing cannot be, uh, be accomplished. We're encouraging the use of cloth face coverings. Under the current guidance, dance floors are still not recommended to be open. This is one of the questions we've been dealing with uh, since the initial mass gathering guidance came out because more and more people are wondering if their event centers uh, um, in terms of weddings and um, things of that nature can be held. When our facilities are hosting large events, uh, one of the major concerns we have is the management of the flow of people. We're asking these facilities to have a one-way in, one-way out um, flow. This will help avoid pinch points, and pinch points can lead to gathering areas and also to close contacts. We're asking businesses to increase the number of hand washing and sanitizing stations available to both employees and customers, um, uh, encouraging the use of those. We recommend them to continue following ND smart restart uh, strategies, especially for those venues that have more than one function in terms of dance floors and then also have uh, caterers available to them. So if they, they have both, we're asking them to follow the mass gathering protocols as well as the restaurant and bar guidance available to us on ND response. Environmental Health will continue to provide the most current information that we have available to us, um, and we have that posted on our website at FargoCastPublicHealth.com. Uh, it's available on the North Dakota Department of Health website, nderespons.gov, and with our federal partners through the CDC. In terms of our role um, as a support to the task force, uh, environmental health has uh, volunteered to be one of the primary contacts to businesses that may have uh, positive cases of uh, COVID-19 in the facilities. Over the years, we've built uh, relationships with the facilities we've licensed, and we feel that uh, in order to support those businesses, that it'd be a good idea to have us make the initial contact, um, whether they have a positive case um, and or not. Uh, the way that it works is environmental health will be contacted by the state epidemiologists if two or more COVID-positive cases have been identified in the business. If a business calls us and is interested in having us come and help them with an assessment, we, we won't deny that either. We're, we're here to provide education and guidance for all. So uh, if they're looking for it, we will provide it regardless of if they have a positive case. Um, once we contact that facility, we'll schedule uh, an on-site visit 
visit. Um, this visit is to go over a work, whether or not uh, the, the facility has um, completed the state's workplace assessment tool. That tool helps identify areas of concern, that, and by recognizing these areas, um, they can help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in their facilities. During the on-site visit, we'll work to verify the completion and answer any questions that the workplace may have, um, and we'll work with facilities to finish the assessment if needed. During the visit, uh, decisions of whether or not testing is necessary will be determined by both uh, environmental health and the business owner. We'll explain the benefits of testing. Uh, testing is designed to have businesses remain open by separating ill employees from healthy staff. The goal is to keep businesses open, not to close them. If the business determines they want to have testing done, we'll complete a form and that will be um, delivered to the National Guard who will then schedule a time to come and test that business. Overall, as I said already, our main objective is to provide education to our businesses, both the ones we regulate and, and others. So through the CDC and the Smart Restart, North Dakota Department of Health, and the information available at FargoCastPublicHealth.com. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is the CMO from Essentia Health, Dr. Rich Vetter. Rich? Did we lose him? Do you, do you have uh, Griffin on? I do see Dr. Griffin on. From Sanford Health, we have uh, Chief Medical Officer, Vice President, Dr. Doug Griffin. Could you start up, please? Sure. Thank you for, uh, for having me uh, today. Uh, just some updates uh, from uh, Sanford here. So currently we're caring for 23 patients in our hospital who have tested positive for COVID-19. The number has been declining for the last uh, couple of uh, uh, couple of weeks. The other portion of that we had that's not included in that number is some patients that were seriously ill from COVID that have subsequently tested negative and been moved off of our COVID unit, but still impact our uh, our census. We have gradually increased in our, our hospital census overall for many other reasons, and now experiencing an average daily census of 450 patients, getting close to our regular hospital volumes before the pandemic. Last week, our drive-through testing appointments averaged uh, nearly 200 a day. The week before, we had a record average of 234 a day. I'd just like to remind everyone that the CDC says it is not yet known whether weather and temperature affect the spread of COVID-19. So we really encourage anyone having any symptoms to call their health care provider and, and or our My Sanford Nurse line to be screened uh, and to see if you need to be scheduled for an appointment. Our drive-through testing team is quite good at taking uh, swab samples and getting folks in and out in a couple of minutes. Patients stay in their car during the appointment and receive the results in less than two days and many times just one day. The more we know, the more we can reduce the spread of the disease. We have plenty of testing capacity and would urge anyone that has symptoms, including fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, muscle pain, new loss of taste or smell, vomiting or diarrhea, and or a sore throat, or has been in contact with somebody known to be positive for COVID, even if they are not experiencing symptoms, to call my Sanford nurse to arrange a test. That number is 701-234-5000. We continue to see patients with more severe medical problems because they waited too long to seek care. A wellness exam may be the first step in preventing this. Beginning this week, we're extending hours at our Fargo Metro primary care clinics to provide a full menu of screening opportunities. We're also making it a little more festive, having some giveaways and discount items on retail items like dermatology and eye exams to encourage people to make appointments and re-engage with their uh, physicians. All primary care departments are participating, including women's, children's, internal medicine, and family medicine, heart and vascular services, colon cancer screening, lab, vision, skin, and mammography screenings will be offered. These are by appointment only, so we can ensure social distancing and safety. 
we have very good access and really want people to stop putting off their health care. Our safety measures, including sanitation, masking and social distancing guideline, signs and building markers are having a very positive impact in our clinics. With sports and annual school physicals coming up, I suggest everyone get their appointments scheduled. They should call their doctors or visit SanfordHealth.org. Our promise is to continue to keep patients and employees safe. In closing, I do want to give a special thanks to our safety and security teams. Every day around the clock, these employees diligently keep our staff, patients, and visitors safe. We are extremely proud of them, and we are equally proud of their strong partnerships with our dedicated local first responders, first responders and law enforcement agencies. During a time when COVID-19 and civic unrest have increased stressful situations, they've continued to provide support that we can care for every patient in a safe manner. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. It's hard to believe sports are going to start again, but the world keeps going on. I think we have Dr. Rich Vetter from Essentia Health. Uh, Rich, are you on? Yes, I'm back on. Thank you and good morning. It's good to be with you all again uh, today. Uh, at Essentia Health, our hospitalized COVID patients have been stable over the past several weeks at about five to 10 hospitalized patients a day, which is consistent with the data that I think Dr. Carson shared with us earlier. As we begin our season of summer, I wanted to provide some medical advice today regarding some summertime activities during this COVID time. First, with the increasing outdoor temperatures, want to remind everyone of the risk of heat exhaustion and the need to stay hydrated. While there is no evidence that COVID-19 infection is spread through water, we recommend not sharing water bottles as a COVID infection could be spread from respiratory droplets and or mouth or lip contacts on the bottles. With the recent COVID restrictions, people may wanna be outside more often in the coming months. We wanna remind people that when you're out in the sun to use your sunscreen to avoid sunburn, but also the risk of skin cancer. And we recommend an SPF of 30 or greater and ask that you apply it several times throughout the day, particularly if you're in water, such as a pool or lake. As far as mosquito repellents, there's no evidence that COVID-19 is transmitted through insects to such as mosquitoes, uh, such as the West Nile virus, for example, is. However, we do recommend the use of mosquito repellents to avoid these other viral infections. As for travel, the State Health Department has some travel guidelines you can check on their website. Uh, the recommendation is still to avoid travel to, travel to areas with a higher prevalence of COVID-19 but we would still recommend limiting any unnecessary travel unless it's required for work or some good reason. Uh, we also would remind people not to travel if you're ill. Uh, and if you're traveling, make sure that you remember to wash your hands, use masking and follow social distancing guidelines. For people who uh, like to camp, uh, particularly if you have higher risk conditions, this would remind you it's probably best to stay within a reasonable distance to medical care. For pools and lakes, uh, again, there's no evidence that COVID-19 can be spread to people through water that's used in pools or hot tubs. Uh, we just recommend that there's proper operation, disinfection, and use of chlorine uh, in those uh, uh, environments. Uh, we want to also remind people that the biggest risk in those environments is to make sure you maintain social distancing, particularly like in locker rooms or on the pool decks. We recommend that people wash their towels with hot water and to dry them with dry heat. Uh, we do not recommend, and it is not recommended, that you keep a cloth mask on if you're going to be in the water. Uh, if you're at the lake uh, or boating, remember to wear your life jacket. So while you're busy with your summertime activities, we also want to remind you, as Dr. Griffin did, not to neglect your health care needs. Uh, so whether it's chronic disease management, sports, physicals, or other acute care needs, we are here and able to see you and to serve you. We understand that access can be a little bit confusing with some of the recent changes due to our COVID pandemic. Uh, just to remind people, you can get appointments uh, still by phone uh, or through your My Health app uh, or by visiting our website, and we have online options available. I want to also remind people that based on your condition or concern that you might have, we might be asking you to do a virtual visit. We found these to be both convenient uh, as well as uh, safe. 
If you do need to come to the hospital or clinic, you will notice, as we've mentioned before, ongoing screening at the door, universal masking, physical distancing, uh, and increased disinfection procedures. If you require surgery or other procedures, you may uh, be tested for COVID-19 in advance of your procedure. As a reminder, if you have a COVID-related concern, we'd still like you to use our e-visit process or call our COVID hotline. We continue to follow the North Dakota Health Department testing guidelines and continue to use the North Dakota Department of Health lab uh, for some of our testing as well as our in-house testing uh, based on the testing indication. Uh, most of the testing is still done for those that are symptomatic. For those that are asymptomatic or close contacts, we want to remind people uh, that that testing should be done ideally seven to 10 days after the last exposure, uh, but still want to remind people that uh, if you had a strong contact, that 14-day uh, quarantine period would still be uh, in place. Uh, at present time, we do have adequate testing supplies uh, through Essentia, uh, both supplies and kits. Uh, in closing, I also want to thank our city and county leaders for their leadership and dedication uh, to our community over these last couple days uh, in these challenging times. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Better. Very much appreciate that. And on the screen, you'll see people in the room because we're trying to open up because we're restarting businesses. So I think you might be a little confused, uh, new players at the table right now. But I have Jim Haney. He's the vice chair of Clay County Commission. And then I have Derek LaPointe, which is stepping in for Mayor Judd today. Mayor Judd was tied up, but Derek's going to talk about business in Minnesota and what's happening there. And to my right, I have Chad Peterson, who's the chairman of the Cass County uh, Commission. And uh, he's going to be not in his man cave that he usually talks to us from, but he's here in person. And we're going to have Bernie Dardis talk for us today, West Fargo president of this commission, and talk about business restart. As we all know, Bernie was a businessman for many years and uh, is very familiar with many things going on in the business area. But we thought he'd be an appropriate one to talk about it and how it's going. And the other thing you have to know about Bernie Dardis is he is also my surveyor. So every day he drives all around the communities. He uh, sneaks up peaks in Minnesota as well as North Dakota. He checks out West Fargo and Fargo. And I'm happy to say, he says, that Fargo is really, really very busy, and he's happy to see us with our restart. Bernie, you're on. Good morning, and thank you, Mayor Mahoney. Uh, the Red River Valley COVID-19 Task Force is planning to continue to reach out to businesses in the area to discuss the best practices in being North Dakota smart in their reopening. This process has been going on for three to four weeks, and we will continue to do that. The goal is for the businesses not to close down at any point in time due to the impact of the coronavirus, but to remain open while keeping their employees as well as their customers and patrons safe. That includes sanitizing, remaining six feet apart, wearing masks, encouraging outdoor seating, washing hands, and of course, the facilities to be cleaned and sanitized on a regular basis and preferably uh, daily. We want to encourage the businesses looking to restart or adjust their protocols to protect their employees and the customers to check out ndresponse.gov. We also want to encourage the businesses to take the North Dakota Department of Commerce Business Impact Survey because it will help identify additional ways to support North Dakota businesses throughout our state. And that survey can be found in the City of West Fargo's social media pages. The financial impact of the coronavirus is a real thing, but there are a lot of helpful resources for the public and small businesses to review during this extremely difficult time. Tips are also on the City of West Fargo social media pages. We are all in this together, and we need to remain North Dakota smart and continue to, the healthy, to be healthy in supporting these businesses. With some of the activities that took place within our communities this past week, that's more important than ever. So I want to encourage all of you to uh, support all these businesses that have had some downtime that have been closed, those that have had some additional problems over the weekend. Please do that all that you can to support them. And as always, you know, our Red River Valley COVID-19 Task Force, we are very grateful to the health professionals. A little bit ago, Dr. Vetter thanked some of the elected officials. But the reality of this is, is that public health 
on the Moorhead side, public health on the North Dakota side, these great physicians that are helping us from Essential and Sanford and the North Dakota Department of Health and the Minnesota Department of Health, they are absolutely critical in guiding us and some of our decision-making process on uh, communicating with our respective governors and our other respected uh, elected officials and how important it is that, again, not only North Dakota smart, Minnesota smart, we need to all be in this together uh, because we have so many people traveling back and forth. The North Dakotans are going to the lake. Minnesotans, a lot of them come over here to work. So I, I can't encourage you enough when uh, in the business community, where either you're on the Moorhead side or you're in the North Dakota side, please continue to go to these websites that offer tips, best practices, protocols, and the like. Protect your employees and protect your patrons that uh, use your businesses. Thank you and be safe. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Dardis. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in, and so they will be answered after uh, Derek LaPointe from Moorhead would talk to us about business in Minnesota. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here and filling in for Mayor Judd. Uh, obviously, we know our best restaurants and businesses are hurting. Restaurants and bars reopened June 1st uh, this past Monday for outdoor seating of up to 50 people per establishment. Uh, we are continuing to support them any way possible. The city of Moorhead and working with state uh, partners are allowing the flexibility of public space uh, to be expanded outdoor seating areas. Uh, we see patios under construction this week, and we know that uh, many businesses are taking advantage of the ability to utilize the nice weather uh, and have outdoor seating. We know that's also uh, a lot of point of frustration for a lot of our restaurant and business owners too. Many of them were expecting uh, more flexibility a couple weeks ago when the, when the state made an announcement uh, about the phase two of reopening in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we, we are av advocating for our businesses and really trying to push for more flexibility at the state level. Salons and other personal services also opened this week on Monday. Uh, we had a lot of people that were, I know, crossing uh, to Fargo to get their hair cut. Uh, we, we knew there was a lot of frustration with our salon and, and barbershop owners that um, they weren't able to provide those services to our community members and a lot of their long-term customers. Uh, but they do have the ability to open and have been open since Monday this week. There's a couple really important pieces that I think I, I really want to stress to our business community uh, because we know they are struggling. One, there is still interest-free loans available through the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. So our state partnership, this is called the Emergency Loan Program. Their loan's up to $35,000. And our region uh, finance partner is the West Central Initiative. Please contact them if you uh, still need help and are still looking for financial assistance through these challenging times. I will stress that there's some urgency in this process. Uh, we've been getting word that uh, uh, funds may be redistributed throughout the state if funds aren't being used in certain territories. So please utilize uh, West Central Initiative and the Emergency Loan Fund uh, if you if you need those resources at this point in time. Uh, again, City of Moorhead, Downtown Moorhead Inc., the Moorhead Business Association continue to be advocates for our business community. Uh, we sincerely appreciate that they have chosen to invest and, and do their business in, in the Moorhead community and are, are great contributors to, to what our, our daily life is in, in Moorhead. We support them in all manners uh, possible. At this time, too, we are working with our local legislators uh, state officials to secure border city flexibility with respect to reopening requirements for the Moorhead business community. And I think that's a really important piece to stress is that um, I know our, our other mayors has made note of it as well as our economy is free flowing across the border. Um, we have people out providing commerce. I think it's a, it's a great thing to see our businesses be supported. Uh, but the, the frustration I think that we're hearing, and, and we do hear you from, from our Moorhead business owners, is that why them, why not us? Uh, we have had conversations with state officials. I wrote a lengthy email to state leadership last week that in turn uh, turned into a, a conference call earlier this week. We know that's gotten to the governor's office, and we hope that some action will be taken in place. Um, it's... it's uh, Obviously, trying times. Uh, we're we're here to support you any way we can. Mayor Dardis made a really good point of, 
even even through the process of reopening, uh, we know that these businesses are going to continue to need our support as they reopen in a full capacity. So support our local business. Know we're here to support you any way we can. We want to be advocates for you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, we'll now go to Ty Philly. You have some questions that came in, Ty? Yes, these questions were submitted at forecastpublichealth.com slash task force. The first question I think might be best answered by Desi Fleming. What adjustments to testing plans will be made given the thousands of people that were not social distancing or wearing masks while protesting in large groups? Sure, thanks, Ty. Um, our local targeted testing strategy has identified those individuals or groups that may be at a higher exposure potential for COVID-19, so we will continue with that strategy. Um, that being said, it's important to be aware that any gatherings in large groups without practicing physical distancing or wearing masks, along with the frequent talking and yelling that normally occurs, does increase your exposure potential for COVID. Um, just being outdoors does not take that risk away. Those attending these events need to know that exposure potential um, is there and they need to monitor their health along with avoiding bringing exposure risk home to their families. So if someone thinks they have had that type of exposure or have, have symptoms, you know, to be sure to call your health care provider for guidance and any potential testing that may need to take place. Thank you. And then our second and final question is addressed to Chris Oman. I was made aware that a server at an area restaurant just posted on social media on their social media page that they tested positive for COVID-19. What sorts of protocols are businesses expected to take when an employee tests positive? Thank you, Ty. Um, as I said in my my talk, there are uh, protocols in place. Um, we would recommend that the facility, um, if they haven't already completed, complete the workplace assessment tool offered by the, um, the North Dakota Department of Health and ND Smart Restart. There's also guidance um, from our federal partners, the CDC, on how to appropriately clean up a workspace if there's a COVID positive situation there. If the business reaches out to us, we'll provide education, guidance, and do an on-site assessment if requested. And then if there's more than, if there's two or more cases in that business, we'll be reached through our state epidemiologists, and then we'll contact the facility locally. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating today. Good day, and I hope you have a good week. Thank you.